This week on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. People are screaming over the radio, eject, eject, eject. And I, I remember pulling the handle and then blacking out. U.S. Navy Commander Rafe Weisham tells us all about ejection seats, including the time one saved his life. Hit it. That is my favorite intro bumper so far. I hope you liked it too. Man, these things are a lot of fun to put together. My 17-year-old son and I, we just find royalty-free music on the internet and uh, find some videos, in this case on YouTube, which if you go to our YouTube channel, we're going to have a playlist where you can see episode four, some of the different ejection videos that are on there and where we stole some of the radio communications from to make that. But uh, it's a lot of fun to put together. And oh, by the way, if you have some favorite you know, royalty-free music, or maybe even have your own little band, well, be sure to uh, put something together that rocks and either send it to me or send me a link so that we can include it here on the show. Well, speaking of that, hello and welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. My name is Vincent Aiello. I am your host. And, you know, like I said last time, I am really just excited and humbled by the response the show has garnered so far. Uh, we've gotten over 3,000 downloads. We have been listened to in over 100 countries around the world. And people are really just tuning in and providing positive feedback. And it's, it's just been a real blessing to me, and I've really enjoyed it. You know, I've had the opportunity to uh, connect with some old friends, make some new ones. People have reached out to me. And I want to just share with you one note I received on Facebook that kind of typifies what I'm talking about. This one is from Ryan, who said, I am a high school student looking to become a naval aviator after I graduate. Whether that means the Naval Academy, which is what I'm trying to do, or ROTC, I don't know. However, I do know that I will do my best to achieve my goals, and your podcast is very inspiring and lights a fire under me. I want the careers that you and your guests have. Thank you for your service, and thanks for an informative and inspiring podcast. Well, Ryan, thank you for that note of support. You know, just knowing that I've helped motivate and uh, excite you makes this whole effort worthwhile. So thanks for taking the time to share that, and uh, I really do appreciate it. All right, a couple other announcements while I'm at it. By popular demand, and by that I mean by my mother's recommendation, <laughs> uh, we've added an index page on the website. It's on the right side, on the top right over there by the About page. And it just lists some simple definitions for some of the terms we talk about here on the show. So if we forget to include the explanation in the interview, uh, or even if we do, we'll try to get it in there so that you can always go look at the index and find out what it is we're talking about. And also, last episode, you might remember I said that we're going to do three episodes a month. And in fact, that is the case. I think we've settled on a routine where we will release a new episode on the first 11th and 21st of every month. And that way, uh, we just, you know, keep the information coming, hopefully keep you excited about it. Uh, but it's also manageable with the other things I need to do. Uh, as I mentioned before, I do have a uh, full other career in a family and uh, this is a hobby I enjoy. And so we got to strike that balance. All right, let's move on to the question and answer segment for this week's show. Uh, my first question comes from Carl. Uh, not sure where he's from, but this was an email. And Carl writes, I was an E2C pilot. While deployed to the Persian Gulf around 2011, someone mentioned, quote, the Farsi air races. When F-14s were still around and were doing airborne respot, they would, from time to time, uh, launch from the cat, go around Farsi, hugging the 12-mile line to trap or the overhead. As our air wing did not have a current record, we decided to go quietly set it in a Hawkeye. I believe it was around 12 minutes using the 17-mile line, and that was on a trap, cat, trap. An F-18 promptly beat our time, but didn't touch what the F-14s originally did. What is the record? Who set it? And what are the, quote, official rules? Well, Carl, thanks for your email. Uh, first, let me explain a few things. So Farsi is a small island in the middle of the Persian Gulf, where aircraft carriers tend to spend a lot of time. And it belongs to Iran, or Iran, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And so as such, we must maintain a 12-mile standoff 
from the island at all times. Otherwise, we would be violating another nation's airspace, and we try not to do that. So if you fly around it at 12 miles, then you haven't uh, violated the airspace, and you can try to go around it as quickly as possible. Now, our respot is simply a way that the flight deck on the aircraft carrier can reposition aircraft. Instead of towing them, they might just launch them off. Of course, you know, the crews will brief and they'll go off and do a mission maybe. And then when, when they come back, it's easier to park them because there's fewer aircraft on the deck. And then a trap, cat trap, is simply an aircraft lands and it goes straight back to the catapult and it goes off again and then it comes back and traps again. And the E2C Hawkeye guys, they have to do that a lot because there's two air crew or two pilots, I should say, specifically in each aircraft and they don't get a chance to always get the amount of landings that they need for currency. So when they do a trap, cat, trap, they'll actually swap seats or at least swap who's flying and uh, each one of the pilots that way can get the currency and proficiency that they need. Uh, so anyway, all that being said, Carl, uh, I did deployments to the Persian Gulf uh, four times over between 97 and 2005, and I can tell you I'd never heard of this. Uh, so I don't know if I just missed it or maybe it was after my time, but I posed your question to a fighter pilot group I belong to on Facebook, and nobody really answered there either. So I'm not sure if it's maybe just a wives' tale or maybe something your air wing did, uh, but I cannot answer your question because I don't know what the record is. Nobody could tell me or who said it or what the quote-unquote official rules are. Um, not really sure. So sorry, I can't do a better job of uh, answering that one. All right, my next question comes via Facebook. This one from someone called Rain. Since you have flown both the F-16 and the F-18, which do you prefer? An F-18 pilot friend tells me when they dogfight, they have to get the F-16s at 250 knots in order to take them. Well, Rain, thank you for your question. You know, by the time I started flying the F-16 at about the year 21, 22 mark, I'd been flying the F-18 for about 3,000 hours at that point. So it's hard to answer that question. I mean, I knew the F-18 so well. I knew where all the switches were. I knew how it handled that it was a natural for me because I didn't have to think really about the muscle memory it took to fly it. On the other hand, the F-16 was new, and so I was excited about it. It handled differently, and that was exciting as far as trying to learn all the nuances of flying that aircraft. So I, I enjoyed the F-16, and it was an amazing performing aircraft, especially the ones we flew in Fallon, Nevada, that had no pylons generally uh, and rarely any drop tanks. So it was clean, and man, were those things fast. I had one up to over Mach 1.9, and... Uh, we, we couldn't go as high as they used to in them because of cabin pressurization challenges. But, you know, there were pictures of guys who had taken them up to 60, 70,000 feet in the past. So I enjoyed flying it because it was comfortable. It was laid back. It was a side stick. And it was just different and new. But if you were to ask me which aircraft would I, you know, if I could afford one own, or if there was a, you know, civilian squadron that was maybe going to hire me for uh, civilian adversary stuff like we talked about in a previous episode, then I would have to go with my old faithful, the F-18 Hornet. But they do dogfight differently. And there's some truth to what your friend said, but you know what? I have to be careful on this show about what I do and don't talk about. I, I guess I have to be more careful about what I do talk about. But I, I have to watch out for anything that's tactics or capabilities or limitations because even though I'm not in the military anymore, I am still bound by confidentiality rules. And frankly, if I disclose something that is protected at the confidential, secret, top secret, you know, these all there's all these different levels, uh, I could actually go to jail. So I'm not going to touch that one, but I do appreciate your question. All right, next up, I've got my first phone message, and I want to play that for you here. Hi, this is uh, Jonathan from Hamilton, New Jersey. I wanted to ask you, I wanted to see what you thought about the uh, – the A-10 retirement, my thought on it is that, you know, against a low-tech insurgent army or military force that uh, it's probably fine where it's not going to meet too much of a air adversary. But um, against uh, organized military, like, say, we were to go to war with North Korea or something like that or Russia, you know, a really bad scenario, do you think the A-10 would be useful in that kind of scenario where, you know, something like an F-18 can go in, hit something, and then get out quickly, the A-10 is kind of stuck at a, a lower speed, so it would be more vulnerable. 
Anyway, uh, love the show, and I will look forward to listening to the next podcast. Thanks a lot. Bye. Well, thank you for your question, John. You know, the A-10 Warthog has been in service for over 40 years. And as anyone who's ever driven an older car can attest, you know, there comes a time where older machines, whether they're vehicles or airplanes or whatever, they just, they start to require too much maintenance and the cost benefit starts to sway too much towards the cost. And and that's going to be the case with the A-10 very soon if it's not already. It was that way towards the end of the F-14's life and it's going to be that way soon for the F-18 Hornet. Now the Super Hornet will be around a little longer, but not so for the Hornet after a couple more years, at least in the Navy. So I guess it really doesn't matter what I think because at some point it will just become cost prohibitive to continue to fly the A-10. Now, I do agree with you that it works fine in a low air threat environment. Uh, But, you know, I I do believe the A-10 was designed for a more formidable threat. Uh, In fact, I believe it was intended to play in the European uh, front if the Soviet Union ever marched west in a Cold War scenario. So it was designed to operate low and close air support of the troops on the battlefield and to destroy as many tanks and armored vehicles as possible. It's built around that 30 millimeter cannon. And, you know, the pilot is protected in a titanium bathtub, essentially, of armor so that he can withstand a lot of battle damage and still make it back. Now, it proved itself in Desert Storm. There were a lot of aircraft that came back, uh, a lot of A-10s, I should say, that came back with heavy battle damage. It was in Grenada before that. It has been in Iraq since, in Afghanistan, and even the Balkans. So, yes, it does operate at low speed, and yes, it is a little bit vulnerable, but it's a good aircraft. And I think the bigger question, as you allude to, is what will ever replace it? And I don't think the F-35 or the F-18 will ever be able to do the job that the A-10 did. Uh, But it seems to be that these days we are going to more specialized or less specialized, I should say, and more try to be good at everything type aircraft. And so that's just the reality of the situation we're in. But I do appreciate the uh, thought-provoking question. And my final question comes from Mauricio, who sends me an email and says, thanks for making this great podcast. It's already my favorite aviation podcast. I'm Brazilian, but living and studying aviation in Boston, Massachusetts. Back in 1995, I tried to enter the Brazilian Air Force Academy, but I failed a medical eye exam. I'm a military aviation enthusiast since little. I have a couple questions. Did you fly the legendary F-14 Tomcat? Do you know something curious about that plane? I've loved it since my father gave me an F-14 G.I. Joe toy when I was a child. And after that, I watched the movies The Final Countdown and Top Gun. Mauricio, thank you for your question, and thanks to your dad for getting you excited about aviation. Uh, That's essentially how I started is when my stepdad took us to air shows when I was little. Uh, No, I did not fly the legendary F-14, and I would agree with that adjective. Uh, It is legendary thanks to the movie, but also because of what it was designed to do and what it has done, or what it did, I should say, while it was still in service. Um, I could have selected it out of flight school at the end of my jet training, but decided on the F-18. And then when I became a Top Gun instructor, the F-14 instructors were allowed to fly the F-18, but not vice versa. I asked about it and they essentially said no because the F-14s they had at the time were the A models and they were a bit finicky. Uh, They were already starting to age a bit and emergencies were not uncommon and they wanted people to have experience uh, to handle those emergencies as well as the type of flying we do at Top Gun. The uh, engines in those aircraft were sometimes prone to stalling and uh, flaming out and whatnot. So, no, I never flew the F-14. Do I know something curious about it? Well, yes, it is the only aircraft, uh, it was the only aircraft in the Navy inventory to have the sweep wing geometry swept back for faster flights, swept forward for slower flight. Uh, The Air Force had the F-111 that did something similar, and uh, no other aircraft has had it since. So, uh, that's curious, I would submit. And uh, again, thanks for your question, and uh, thanks to all fathers out there who get their children interested in aviation. All right, so on to the interview with Rafe Weisham, as you heard up at the top of the show. He's going to talk ejection seats and giving 
give us his harrowing story of riding one out of a doomed F-14. And you're going to hear a little bit of redundancy with episode three. You know, Vern and I were talking seat pans and coke fittings and sea wars and all those things. Well, we'll talk about them here too with Bloach. And that's okay because it really does help you to understand it better. And it provides that information from a slightly different perspective. So without any further ado, let's get on to the interview with Rafe Weisham about ejection seats. Okay, today on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, we are talking ejection seats. And to help me do that, I have with me Commander Rafe Weisham, call sign Bloach, United States Navy. Bloach, welcome to the show. Joe, thanks for having me. You bet. My pleasure. All right, so before we get into ejection seats, give us a quick background on you. Where are you from? Where you went to school? What your career has been like so far? Yeah, absolutely. So I uh, grew up in a little town in Oregon called Madras. Went to the Naval Academy. Uh, my dad was a uh, P3 NFO and uh, got me interested in the Navy, uh, but really the movie Top Gun was uh, had a, a big influence on my uh, decision to join. I uh, went to the Naval Academy. Uh, from there, uh, selected aviation. Went to Pensacola uh, and uh, started flying the F-14. So flew the F-14 for a few years, uh, then uh, got picked up for go to Top Gun. I went to Top Gun, uh, did a weapons school tour, bouncing back and forth between Lemoore, California, and uh, Naval Air Station, Oceana, Virginia. Uh, then did a commanding officer, got lucky enough to be a commanding officer of a squadron in Japan, the VFA-102 Diamondbacks. Currently, I'm at the Western Air Defense Sector in up near Seattle, Washington, on McCord Air Force Base. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. Outstanding. Yeah, and it was after Top Gun uh, that we met at the weapons school. We were stationed there together and had yeah, a good time. Yeah, absolutely. So, outstanding. Okay. Well, so I would hope anyone who's listening to this probably already knows in general what an ejection seat is. Uh, but just to set the tone for the discussion today, can you just give us a quick summary of uh, what an ejection seat is? Yeah, ejection seat is, uh, bottom line, is a way to uh, get out of an aircraft if you have some sort of situation where the aircraft is not recoverable. So it's a, a second chance at life, if you will. They were originally uh, designed, or the first idea of the ejection seat was in the early 1900s. Uh, and then in around uh, 19, late 1920s, early 1930s, uh, the design of a solid propellant uh, ejection seat was made, and the first actual ejection from an aircraft uh, in distress was in uh, World War II, I believe, in January of 1942. Uh, subsequently, uh, as aircraft got faster, flew higher, uh, the idea that a solid propellant is probably not good enough to get you out of the aircraft, uh, so they designed the rocket propellant, and uh, currently that's what we use today. So uh, design has, has changed over the years. Uh, people have ejected from uh, fast aircraft. I think 3.25 Mach is about the fastest, and altitudes up uh, up to 80,000 feet. Uh, but bottom line, it's a way to get out of the aircraft and uh, a second chance at life if the aircraft decides that it doesn't want to uh, cooperate that day. Right. So essentially, instead of getting up out of your seat and bailing out, like we have to do in a lot of aircraft and you might see in a World War II movie or whatnot, you're essentially, as the air crew in a tactical aircraft, uh, sitting on a rocket seat, as you just described, and there's some sort of initiation device, and it can propel us out and away from the aircraft. So um, that, that's fairly fascinating, too, that uh, the, the speeds and altitudes. But you didn't also talk about the fact that you can do it, let alone up to 80,000 feet, but down all the way on the surface, not even moving in the aircraft. Isn't that correct? That's correct, yes. Uh, most seats are uh, designed to be zero zero, which means you can uh, get out of the aircraft at zero feet, uh, at zero knots. So so if your aircraft's just parked, not moving, and you're in it, and there's some sort of emergency, you could pull the handle, and and you should be able to, based on winds, I think there's some caveats on strong winds if it's a tailwind or whatnot, but in general, you should be able to be propelled clear of the aircraft, have your parachute deploy, and give you one quick swing before you slap down, back down to earth. Is that right, right? That's absolutely correct. And, and you talked about the, the bailing, bailing out of aircraft. So part of the reason they were designed in the first place was uh, as aircraft got faster, uh, it, w it became dangerous to bail out an aircraft. You got a lot of a lot of different issues. You got the wind. Uh, you got to try to jump out of a moving aircraft and avoid hitting uh, the stabilizers of the aircraft or parts of the aircraft that are behind you. Uh, and and typically, when you're when you're trying to get bail out an aircraft, you probably had some sort of uh, catastrophic failure, which could affect your ability to actually bail out of the aircraft. So. 
uh, ejection seats were designed to, to try to save uh, some people, and it's done a pretty good job over the years. Yeah, and they've done quite a bit of that. We were talking before we started recording about, uh, I believe it's Martin Baker, the maker of the uh, most prolific ejection seat, at least currently, uh, has in their existence saved how many pilots, or at least was it so many ejections or so many? No, uh, it saved uh, 7,550 lives as wow. of this recording. That's amazing. Now, to be fair, some people eject and don't survive. Absolutely. Um, I actually personally witnessed two on an S3 one time on the John F. Kennedy. Um, they went off the waist catapult uh, and, and over-rotated uh, to the side, and by the time they pulled the handle to eject, it shot them straight in the water, and that was something I'll never forget. It's awful. But uh, what types of aircraft are equipped with ejection seats? So most of your tactical aircraft are going to be equipped with ejection seats, so up to uh, probably four seats. Uh, then, then there's a sequence of events that's going to uh, get you out of the seat, especially when you're talking uh, multiple uh, crew aircraft. There's a sequence to make sure you don't hit each other uh, as we as we get out of the aircraft. And I don't know if we want to get into that at this point, or or we can keep talking about some other stuff. Yeah, no, that's fine. So, like in other words, a single seat fighter might uh, have obviously just that one seat and it goes. But a B1 bomber, or even a B52, or the EA6B Prowler, which I think is virtually gone now. I don't know. Marine Corps, I guess, is maybe still flying them. But the idea is you've got two people sitting side by side and then another row of two people. So all four of those guys, if just one of them pulls the handle, then all four of them will eject in some sort of sequence that's been planned by engineers so they don't bump into each other. Is that essentially what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. And and for example, in the, in the F-18, which is what's flown primarily by the United States Navy at this point, uh, the as you pull the handle, whether it's the pilot or, or the aft crew member, either the, the WISW or the ECMO, depending on the type of F-18 you're flying, uh, it's going to initiate that sequence of events that you mentioned. So as you pull the handle, four tenths of a second later, the canopy is going to go because the canopy of the F-18 is not designed to be ejected through. So it's going to take four tenths of a second for that canopy to blow and clear. And then four tenths of a second later, the aft crew member is going to go, followed by four tenths of a second later, uh, the front crew member. So a total of 1.2 seconds from the time that the ejection is initiated by one of those two crew members until both air crew are out of the aircraft. Wow. So it happens very quickly, which is important because when we operate at high speeds, you need to have something happen right away. So if you pull that handle, it has to happen quickly. Yeah. And, and more importantly, not only high speeds, but low altitude. So a lot of times... In naval aviation, we're operating around an aircraft carrier, and uh, a lot of the stuff that, a lot of the tragic events or catastrophic events, I guess if you want to call it, happens uh, near the ground. So you want to be able to get out of the aircraft quickly. Uh, a lot of times, if you if you have a catastrophic event uh, up high, it's not that important, but uh, unfortunately or fortunately for us, it all happens uh, near the water typically. Yeah, true. All right, so we've already started touching up. Well, let's just finish up quickly. Uh, you talked about on tactical aircraft, so we're specifically meaning their military aircraft. Uh, and there are a handful, I would say, civilian aircraft that have them, but they're mostly military-style aircraft or even former military. That's correct, yeah. Okay, So, but generally, when we say tactical, we're talking about fighters and attack and bombers and whatnot. Generally, you're not going to see an ejection seat in a helicopter, right? That's correct, yeah. Okay, I think there was one we found on That's correct, yeah. Wikipedia We've, that... Yep. It, jettison the blades first or something. And then you're not going to obviously find them on typically cargo or passenger aircraft because it would be a little uh, undignified, I suppose, for the crew to leave and have everyone else be stuck inside a stricken aircraft. Uh, so typically your high performance jet uh, aircraft, uh, military based. Right. And, and most of the time, the, the aircraft that uh, are designed with ejection seats, there is no other option uh, if you have some sort of catastrophic event where uh, we saw uh, an airplane, uh, 737, I want to say. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but that, that landed in New York. And uh, you can help me out here, but uh, there's a movie made about it. Oh, Sully? Uh, yeah, yeah actually, Sully, was a, thank you. Yeah, thank that you. was an Airbus. Yeah, so an Airbus. So, so in that case, uh, they have other options. Uh, Ditching, not, not that a, example. Not a good option necessarily, right. but other options. Whereas some of these tactical aircraft, uh, the way they're designed, you can't really just... Um, glide them into the water, they are going to crash. So right. you need a you need an ejection seat to have that second chance. And that being said, I guess there are a couple stories uh, as we were doing our research for this episode where people have actually ejected underwater. Uh, I don't know how on earth that possibly worked, but apparently it did get them free of the aircraft as it was sinking and at least f clear enough to go through the procedure that we'll talk about here in a second and uh, egress the aircraft, which is the ultimate goal, right? 
Yeah, not quite sure how that happened. I had never heard of that as well, but uh, if, if you can't get out of the aircraft, you might as well try something. And Preservation is important. That's right. All right, so we started talking about it. So let's, uh, first off, let's talk about when you or I get to the aircraft, uh, the ejection seat is installed. There are some things we need to do first. So what, what are we looking at when we first get up to the cockpit uh, on that ejection seat? Yeah, one of the most important things is the safe arm handle. So uh, when, you want it, when you walk up to the aircraft, and you and you're taking a look at the ejection seat. You want to make sure it's safe because if you get in the if you start to step inside the cockpit, your foot catches on the handle. If you pull that, well, it's unsafe. Nothing's going to happen. Well, it's an arm, uh, and you pull it, and you're standing on top of it. It's going to send you through the canopy. Uh, it's, it's not going to be a good day. That would for not you. be pretty. So no. essentially, it's like a safety device on a firearm. That, exactly. Exactly. Because like this rifle. is an explosive. Item. I mean, it's Absolutely. almost a firearm, for heaven's sakes. Absolutely. Okay. So, so then uh, before we sit in it, we look the thing over, correct? Yeah. So we have maintainers that um, operate or, or, or work on the ejection seat. So uh, we trust them for the most part. And we do trust them to, to take care of that. But we are that second eye to, to look. So we'll, we'll take a look at a few things just to make sure, just in general, just the overall integrity of the seat um, before we get in. We're just looking for anything that's out of place, possibly. I think there's one part where there's a battery with, with a band that's around it, and if the band is a different color, it means the battery Correct. has been... So we're just looking for it to be fully functioning, no discrepancies visually anyway, and so that it looks like it's been installed correctly and it's all ready to go. Is that's that correct. essentially true? Okay. Uh, and then we hop in it, and we need to strap ourselves to it, correct? So whereas in a vehicle, let's say a car... When I sit in a car, the seat belt is part of the car. But when we sit in it, we are strapping this ejection seat essentially to what we're wearing. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So you'll, uh, you'll put your, your harness over your shoulders. You'll put a lap uh, restraint on. Um, and then you will connect the leg harnesses uh, that go around your calf. And that's gonna, what's gonna do, what those are going to do is as you eject, they're going to pull your legs in so that you don't lose your legs at the knee off of your displays. So in a fighter aircraft, you're pretty close to the displays. Uh, you don't want to you lose your legs when you go out, so they're going to pull your legs underneath the seat as that uh, ejection seat goes. So we need to be in a proper body position because we're in such a small cockpit that if we're not in a correct position when we go out, we could hit something on the way out. And since we're going out with an explosive force of approximately 20 Gs or so, maybe more at that first impulse, then we could hit something. And in fact, those flail injuries, not just from the aircraft, but then from the wind, as soon as you're exposed to that, like we talked about before, if you try to bail out from a high-speed aircraft, well, same thing when you eject, you end up in that high-speed airstream. If you're not holding your body correct, your arms could fly out or your, uh, your neck can be snapped down for, based on the impulse up. So you want to make sure you're in the correct position so that you don't do any injuries right there at the very beginning of the sequence. Correct. Most, most injuries are not from the actual ejection sequence itself, but from being out of the correct body position as you go up and you hit that airstream. So you're, you're sitting in the cockpit uh, at zero knots of wind. As soon as you eject, now you're exposed to whatever airspeed you're flying at the time, up to five, 600 knots. Uh, and you can imagine standing in a, at a hurricane that's got 100 mile an hour winds. Now you got five, six times that wow. as you eject, exposed to that. So if you don't have your arms in, your legs in, uh, you're going to have some significant injuries. And I've, I've known guys that have ejected and, and had some uh, significantly torn ligaments in both their shoulders and they're growing uh, from, from having that wind pull, that, pull those arms and legs. And there's also a handle in multi-seat aircraft to tell the aircraft how many seats are occupied. Is that correct? So in other words, if I'm flying a two-seat F-18 by myself... I'm going to put this handle in a certain position. And if I'm with you, I'm going to put it in a certain position. But if I'm flying some, let's say, news reporter before an air show, it's going to be in yet another position. Is that correct? That's correct. So uh, there's an aft initiate and norm. When you fly... Those are the positions that you can turn this switch to? Yeah. So, okay. so you have two positions. You really have three positions, solo. Uh, so, so if I'm by myself, we're going to put it in solo. It takes a certain pin to hold it there. That's correct. And then if I eject... I only go. The back seat doesn't go. That's because right. Because there's nobody would, in it. There's no one in it. So right. it, could, it could throw off. It's, it doesn't have the weight in it. Um, so uh, typically we don't fly it in solo because there's, I like to think that my job is important. Uh, but, uh, yes, yeah, so you, as, you, as you mentioned, if it's, um, there's, there's norm, uh, which really we're only going to fly it in norm when you're flying with somebody like a reporter, as you talked about. Uh, somebody maybe you don't trust back there to really understand how it works, 
Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But normally you fly to an aft initiate, which aft, initi- aft initiate means that if either person pulls the handle, then it's going to go through that normal sequence that we talked about. The canopy goes four tenths of a la- second later, the back seat goes. If we put it in norm and the aft seat pulls the handle, the person sitting in the back seat pulls the handle, only that person is going to go. So if you've got that news reporter who just decides seven and a half G's is not designed for him and the only thing he can think about or her can think about is to eject and pull that handle, at least now the pilot is going to stay with the aircraft. He's going to fly an aircraft uh, that has no canopy. A convertible. He's going to fly a convertible. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but it, it, And it's funny. It's happened. Uh, and it's really not funny, but it, it happened in Fallon. A, uh, uh, they were flying uh, a guy who was not an aviator, and he got inverted, and he he kind of got rode up in the strap. So he's kind of pushed up towards the canopy and he kind of wanted to pull himself back towards the seat. He was a little right and a little high. And the first thing he grabbed was the ejection handle to pull himself back towards the seat. Well, instead of pulling himself back towards the seat, it pulled the handle and the canopy went and he went, but the pilot was still there and the pilot brought that, that aircraft back and safely recovered it. So instead of losing a multi-million dollar aircraft, now we've all we've lost is a, is a canopy and a seat. Wow. So if you and I are flying together, which I think we did a couple of times at the weapon school, um, once we get airborne or just before we get airborne, we're going to put it in aft initiate, which means we're a crew. We're both trained. If something happens, either one of us can pull the handle and both of us will go. But if we've got someone back there who isn't a crew, we don't want the person in the back seat to eject the front seater. So in that switch position, then he just sends himself. And in this case, the pilot in that example in Fallon, Nevada, that you were talking about several years ago, uh, was able to come back and land that aircraft. That's correct, yep. Oh. And uh, I was actually at the officer's club that night, and I can remember that gentleman you're speaking of was actually the battle group commander for that whole battle group, which included that air wing, which included that squadron. So in other words, they wanted to take this gentleman out and fly him, but he was actually a surface warfare officer. So his job primarily was driving ships. And um, he was in the officer's club that night, still in his flight suit, still in his boots. We were all dusty from his landing out in the desert, as you uh, described. And, uh, you know, he'd gotten checked out by medical, and he was all set to go. And it was quite a story, but a little bit embarrassing because I'm sure the money involved to repair the canopy, well, put a new canopy on and put a new seat in and fix the scorching from those rockets going off probably wasn't very cheap. Yeah, probably not. (laughs) Thank goodness that doesn't happen more often. Okay, so let's let's talk through the sequence. So something's happening. It's not important what for this context, uh, but we need to egress the aircraft. So the seat is armed if we're flying, of course, hopefully, and we pull the handle. Now, I used the movie Top Gun a lot because I expect that most of my audience has seen it if they're listening to me. And they probably remember the scene where, uh, who is it, Maverick and Goose are trying to eject and they're reaching for the overhead handle. Uh, was that what you had, in fact, on your F-14 when you first started flying? Yeah, absolutely. So we okay. had two handles that we could pull. So one was between the legs, and then one was uh, a canopy that was just above your head. Okay. And now with the F-18, uh, we just have the one between our legs. That's correct. And yep. so if you need to, you pull that sharply up, and then the rockets fire. So take us through the sequence. You, you already said earlier the canopy goes first. So we're uh, we're in the right body position, and now we're you know the seat is going up. Um, and what what happens then? Yeah. So the uh, rocket motors are going to fire. Uh, it's going to get you clear of the aircraft. A drogue chute is going to come out to stabilize the seat. And then depending on what altitude you're at, you're going to basically free fall in that seat until uh, a certain altitude, and not really important for this uh, discussion, but about 14,000 feet. And then you should get your uh, parachute should deploy. You get seat man separation. uh, And then your seat will then fall from you as you get pulled out of the the seat by the... um, force of the of the chute filling up with uh, with wind and hopefully then uh, getting you settled all the way down to the ground. Okay, so so anyone who has done a tandem jump, let's say skydiving, has maybe if they looked at the video later seen that little small parachute that's trailing above them and that's basically stabilizing them so they can free fall for a while. So we yep. have the same thing is what you're saying. Yep, so absolutely. So if I eject at 20,000 feet and I'm of course going to be freaking out because this usually doesn't happen. It does to some people, maybe once, maybe more. But um, in a career, I've made it through my career, thank God, without trying it. But um, I might be still in that seat falling, like a free-falling skydiver, from 20,000, you, you said, to about 14,000. 14, I mean, that's got to be, feet, yep. I'm thinking, a little unnerving. Absolutely. But, but then something happens. So there's so there's uh, barostatic sensors, if you will, in this seat. It's actually a very technologically advanced uh, contraption, if you will, that can detect the altitude. 
And it's got those batteries we talked about. And so there is a sequence that occurs. And then now some of that remaining uh, energy can be used to pull out the main chute, which we're, we're not wearing, right? So unlike... World War II movies where you see the pilots walking out to the aircraft with a parachute strapped on them. We don't. Where, where is the parachute? The parachute is built into the seat. So okay. uh, the parachute stays in the seat. Uh, and when you walk to the aircraft and you strap in, those shoulder harnesses that you attach, you're actually attaching the parachute to the rest of your gear. Okay. Interesting. So that main parachute comes out, which I think is 17 roughly feet in diameter or something like that. And the force of that, as you just said, then finally causes the separation of the air crewman and the seat itself. So what happens to the seat at that point? Seat will just fall to the ground. Hopefully no one's in the way. Yeah, golly. So if it's over a city, that could be pretty destructive, I would think. For sure. Okay. Don't mind the aircraft. That's also falling. Well, true. Ground. All right. Well, that's uh, <laughs> very true. Okay. So now the pilot, or uh, in your case, uh, weapon system officer, is is falling under a hopefully good canopy, and we don't have to talk about some of the various things they train us to deal with if there's a malfunction in that. But now we're floating down. We have a second to say, holy, you know what? I can't believe this is happening. Uh, what happens at that point? Uh, is it over? Uh, no, absolutely not. It's not over. Uh, you all kinds of different scenarios. You could be falling over a city, uh, over water, over trees. Um, but first of all, so it's going to get you away from the, you're seated about 14,000 feet. The parachute's going to def- to inflate. And like you said, hopefully it inflates properly. And there's different things we can do if it doesn't inflate properly. But it's going to be about a minute per thousand feet. So it's going to take you 14, 15 minutes before you actually reach the ground, assuming uh, the ground is at sea level. So if uh, you eject over uh, high terrain, uh, less than that, obviously, but uh, you, you eject over sea level, which typically we do since we fly in the Navy and we're, mo- we're over water a lot of times. It's going to take you 14 to 15 minutes. So there's procedures you have uh, in order to, uh, to properly set yourself up for landing. Uh, and we have an uh, uh, analogy. It's IROC. So the first thing is going to be inflate. So you can uh, go ahead and inflate your... Um, it's... The life preserver, there essentially. The life preserver, So even right. if I'm landing on land, I still want to do that. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So especially yeah, it's like if a cushion. It's, it's a cushion. Uh, it's going to, it's kind of like a neck brace. Uh, with it's a, it's a very tight life preserver filled with a significant amount of air. So if you're going through trees, it's going to kind of protect your face from hitting those limbs. Huh. Uh, so you're going to want to do that anyway. Right. Uh, you can then, the next one is R stands for release. So you're going to release your raft. Where is uh, the raft? Uh, the ra- the raft is attached to your seat. So the uh, when you when you I talked about attaching the harnesses over your shoulder for the parachute, uh, the raft is in your actual seat pan. And when you attach those uh, f- uh, connections across your lap, you're actually connecting the seat pan, which in, in there is your raft. Okay. So as we're under the parachute gliding down, we've got this thing strapped to our butt, basically, and the backs of our legs. And we would hate to land with that, so we're going to release that early so it can dangle below us, essentially, and and uh, not be there when we land. That's right. Okay. And then you have some options. So, so that's uh, the O, I-R-O-K. So now we're go. up to O, which is options. That's right. So you have options. Uh, those options could be your visor. So you could, a lot of times you're going to want to put that down, especially if you're coming down over trees, once you can protect those eyes. That's the visor in your helmet over your eyes, yeah. That's right. Um, gloves. So you can either take your gloves off if you need to be able to uh, feel for uh, some of the gear before you land. Uh, if you're ejecting at that altitude, it's pretty cold. So uh, you're going to want to have your gloves on. Uh, hopefully you have your gloves on when you eject and, and you still have the dexterity in your fingers. But as you get lower, you might need to take those off. Uh, you want to keep them handy. So you're going to shove them in your gear so you still have them when you land. Uh, so those are some of the options that you're looking at as you come down. And then finally, uh, K for Coke fittings. Uh, so just feeling where those Coke fittings are, because when you hit the water, you're going to want to, especially if you are over water, you're going to want to, or even over land for, and we'll talk about both those scenarios. So if you're over water, you're going to want to release those, those, uh, that parachute, uh, in order to not get drug underwater or drug across the water. Although they are in designed to be, if you land in seawater, that seawater will fire those anyway, but you want to be prepared in case that doesn't work properly. And then over land, you want to be able to quickly release them so you don't get drug. If it's uh, a lot of wind over land, you could get, there's been known to have people uh, drugged to their death as they, as they land successfully ejected out of a, out of a catastrophic event and then die because they get drug uh, over land. So you want to be able to quickly release that parachute over land. That actually happened to a good friend of mine, uh, Major Duke Spar. He uh, bumped into his wingman over Iraq one night. We were Top Gun instructors together, and um, 
I think they were at 33,000 feet or something and uh, had a mid-air collision. And I don't know the altitude they ejected at, but uh, they survived the mid-air collision, survived the ejection. And it was super high winds that night over Iraq. And when they landed, uh, I don't know the details, but they were drugged to their death, as you just described. And that's, that's tragic because everything worked except for the fact that they were flying in super high winds and were unable to uh, release themselves. So Right, and we actually have limits now for when uh, what we can take off in. So uh, winds over a certain airspeed, it's a, uh, called 25 knots, but winds over a certain airspeed, uh, you're not allowed to take off uh, due to that reason that you could, uh, if you have to eject, and a lot of the stuff, bad stuff happens when you're close to either landing or taking off. So uh, we kind of protect ourselves by uh, limiting what we can take off as far as winds. And just to uh, clarify, so you said earlier, Coke fittings. I uh, just want to make sure people understand. So it's not like a Coca-Cola you drink. It's spelled K-O-C-H, and I don't know if that's someone's name or whatever, but that's essentially just the name of the fitting that you said earlier attaches you from the uh, harness that you're wearing to the parachute. And inside of there is a small device that can sense the salt water, as you described. And when you land, it should pop off automatically for you. But either way, you're supposed to back that up. So if we land in water, we probably go under a couple feet, and then we bob back up because we've got our life preserver attached. Uh, what happens if we land on land? Yeah, we have. Uh, if we're going to land on land, uh, it's it's kind of like jumping off of a second story building. So uh, we have procedures for for land on how we get our body into the right position, knees bent, feet together, and, and kind of fall to our side. So uh, I don't I don't recommend trying this at home. No, please. Uh, but if you uh, if you if you jump off of a second story building, and you keep your legs straight. Uh, and you just try to you just try to land normally like you uh, jumped off of a bed, uh, you would probably hurt yourself uh, significantly, do some damage to your legs, break a leg or two. So we train to uh, what's called a PLF uh, so that when we do land that hopefully uh, we protect our, our legs and, uh, and don't have any injuries from that landing, especially over hostile territory in, in enemy territory. You, the last thing you want to do is when you land and, and you got some bad guys looking for you, the last thing you want to do is be, be stuck where you are because you have a broken leg and you can't move. So you're saying we had some sort of catastrophic event that caused us to eject. We go through the sequence we just talked about. And when it's time to land on the land, which could, oh, by the way, be anything from, you know, like you said earlier, city, telephone wires, buildings to desert with rocks and cacti, that you're coming down at the same speed as a person who's jumping off a two-story building. Yeah, that's correct. Wow. The, the parachute that uh, we that that we, that is designed is fairly small, so it's not going to uh, hold you up there and come down a nice soft landing. Um, you can do some things with the parachute to uh, uh, turn into the wind, which will help slow you down. Uh, but everything you do, if you do everything properly, you're still coming down as if you had just jumped off a second story building. If you don't do everything properly, then you're going to be even faster, and you're probably no matter what you do, as far as your body position, you're going to cause some injuries. Wow. Well, I'm glad I never had to try that, but as I understand, you have. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I have uh, ejected out of an aircraft. Uh, no kidding. Well, yeah, so. tell us the story. Sure. So it's uh, it's been quite a while now. It's been about 15 years, it, actually March 2nd, 2002 to be exact. Uh, I was deployed. Uh, we were uh, in the Gulf. I was on the John F. Kennedy, and we were uh, heading over to Afghanistan for... Uh, to, to take the fight to the enemy. Uh, we had just pulled out of uh, Crete, which is a, an island in the Med, and uh, it was our second day of flight ops, and, and right the, the last day of flight ops before we were going to go through the Suez Canal and start heading uh, to the, to the uh, waters south of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, I remember uh, pretty vividly that we were taxied up to the catapult. I was on catapult one, which is, as you look at the aircraft carrier, it's in front of the tower on the right side. And, and next to me on catapult two are two of my good friends. Uh, so I remember we were, we were set on the catapult. When you're, when you're on the aircraft carrier, you launch at a certain time. So for us that day, it was a uh, two o'clock in the afternoon, 1400 for you military types launch. And uh, we were there early. So we were just sitting there waiting. Uh, we had uh, done the normal startup procedures, and the aircraft was a it was a good a good aircraft. So we headed up there, and we were we were attached to the shuttle, and we were ready to go. So uh, at fourteen hundred or two o'clock, uh, we uh, were given the okay to launch. We ran up the power. It's uh, probably another podcast uh, that you might do that talks about the, all, all this. But uh, bottom line is, uh, we got we got uh, up there and launched off the front of the aircraft, and we got about a third of the way through the catapult. So. Uh, what we what we're looking for is 
in the in the F-14, so it was, uh, I fly the F-18 now, but uh, I flew the F-14 back then. What we're looking for is about 120 miles an hour as we go off the front of the carrier, minimum. Uh, ideally, about 160 miles an hour. Uh, well, at about somewhere around 100 miles an hour, which is about a, th- a third to halfway down the uh, catapult, uh, we the nose gear of the F-14, where it's attached to the catapult, to the shuttle, uh, the nose gear broke. And so the, the nose gear of the F-14 uh, started going down the shuttle and hit the end of the shuttle at 305 knots, uh, 305 miles an hour. As you can imagine, the shuttle is designed to pull a 66,000-pound aircraft, and now it's pulling about 1,000 pounds of nose gear. So it's, it rapidly accelerated and uh, destroyed the front of the, the, the carrier, and then it was took a lot of time to repair. Uh, so we're, we go off the front of the carrier, myself and my pilot, uh, somewhat less than 100 knots. Uh, and the safety center is going to later look at, at the tapes and realize we probably went off with about 65 to 70 uh, miles an hour or knots, if you want, if you will. Which is not near enough to fly an F-14. Not near enough to fly an F-14. Okay. Now you're just a falling piece of metal. So uh, people are screaming over the radio, eject, eject, eject. Uh, and I, I remember pulling the handle and then blacking out. Uh, from the force of the ejection, as you mentioned earlier, about 20 Gs, the body's, uh, or at least flying the aircraft, designed not to exceed 7 Gs in the F-14, now 7.5 Gs in the in the F-18. Well, now you put that 20 Gs on your body, and it just it just took all the blood out of my brain, and I, I blacked out for a little bit. Uh, didn't, uh, didn't black out for long because I was coming to as I was hitting the water. So we talked about some of that sequence. I didn't really have time to go through the... IROC procedures, the inflate, release, options, coke fin. I didn't have time to do that. I ejected it basically 50 feet. The aircraft carrier is 60 feet. We were just off the front end when I ejected. Uh, so I got my parachute inflated. I got about a half swing. And this time I'm also coming to from uh, blacking out. First thing I'm thinking is I just survived a ejection, and now I'm going to get run over by the Kennedy. Uh, and also thinking through the, those things we talked about earlier where – you want to release your coke fittings. Well, in my, in my case, this, the, the devices that are designed to fire the, the, those coke fittings without you manually releasing them, those worked. So I start, as soon as I started thinking about it, all of a sudden I hear a boom, boom, and, and my parachute was gone. Uh, the next thing I was thinking about is, you know, the, the life preserver, you need to manually inflate it if it doesn't inflate itself. So I'm like, well, I'm not floating yet, but it took a couple seconds and that thing manually inflated. So once again, that thing is designed to inflate itself, uh, in the salt water and it worked as advertised. Um, so now I'm just float floating in front of the aircraft carrier. Cause as I ejected, I kind of went up into the right, but, uh, with the way the F-14, had kind of tipped over going in the front. I kind of shot about four or 500 feet in front of the carrier. And now the carrier is coming at me because the carrier, when it launches aircraft, is going about 20, 25 miles an hour. Uh, so now I'm just trying to swim away. And, and that's a big ship. So that's got to be a little a big scary. Ship. <laughs> it, it, it is a very big ship. Uh, I, the law of gross tonnage, I would not have won that fight. No. So I am as, I, as I'm floating uh, back, I'm trying to swim away. And we talked about how your, your raft is in your, is in your seat pan. Well, as I'm trying to swim away from the aircraft carrier, I, I just, I just can't swim like I'm normal. And I'm not a great swimmer, but I, I felt like I was just getting drugged down. So I realized it was my raft, my seat pan and it, whether it was panic or just knowing that I'm looking at the aircraft carrier, I don't really need my raft. I got my, my, my life raft is a, uh, 90,000 ton boat sitting right above me. I got rid of that. So I got rid of my raft at that point. Kept trying to back, uh, backstroke away from the aircraft carrier. And, and uh, I find out later that based on where the airplane landed, it kind of fell off to the left, that the ship did a left-hand turn in order to turn the screws of the aircraft carrier away from the, uh, from the wreckage. Well, what would that mean? As well, We didn't really get into this, but as a two-seat aircraft, in order so you don't hit each other as you eject, there's a time delay, but there's also a directional uh, difference. So the back seater will go slightly to the right and the front seater will go slightly to the left. So I went right. Well, as the aircraft carrier is, is turning to the left, as you can imagine, it's turning the aft into the ship towards me. 
So the whole time I'm I'm trying to swim away, I'm thinking I just survived an ejection and I'm going to get run over by the aircraft carrier and now I'm going to die that way. Uh, luckily for me, uh, I voided the aft into the ship by about, uh, which is the back, so aft being back, I, I voided that by about 20 feet, uh, bobbed around in the water for a while, and now I'm just sitting in the water, I'm floating, uh, but shock is now taking over just from the, the nature of the catastrophic event. 62 degree water, pretty cold, so... Um, and the back of the ship is important because that's where the screws are turning. So it's all that churned up water and it could drag you down or even cut you up. Right. Absolutely. What, and I, and I learned later, uh, you know, I'm panicking and I'm thinking through worst case scenario, but what I learned later is the ship basically shut down those screws as soon as that happened because they're, they're worried about the ship and, and chewing up the aircraft and they're trying to stop because they have a, they, they have air crew in the water. They want to stop as, as quickly as possible, which doesn't really happen very quickly. It turns out that the aircraft carrier ended up about three quarter mile from me by the time it stopped all that, all that weight, even going to, to idle, if you will, uh, on the boat. Okay, so you're bobbing there, you're in shock, but uh, things are starting to come to clarity. I'm guessing the helicopter arrives overhead fairly quickly. Yeah, so I'm I'm in the water. Uh, I I'm I'm trying to look for my pilot. I can't really see where the pilot is in the water. Um, and the, and the aircraft, the helicopters, uh, without getting into too much detail, just have to be a certain distance from the aircraft carrier as the launch happens. Well, that air those helos were about max distance, so ten miles away when it happened. Uh, so it takes the helicopters a little time to get there. Uh, they also, uh, the reports from people who are on the flight deck of the aircraft carrier, seeing both myself and my pilot in the water, uh, relayed that the helo needed to go to the pilot first for uh, for reasons that we may talk about a li- in a little bit. But So that one helo that is, that is in the air at that time goes after and is trying to get the pilot out of the water. The second helo, the helo that actually picks me up is the alert helo that is that is on the aircraft carrier. So an alert helo is is a helo that is is ready to go and has to be airborne in a certain amount of time. So it takes them about 15 minutes to get that helicopter off the flight deck, and I am in the water. So as I mentioned, 1400, 2 o'clock is when my aircraft went down the cat stroke and I ejected, and about 1425 is when I actually got picked up out of the water, which I which I thought was a long time considering I was staring at the aircraft. Uh, as I went by, but plus you're in cold water. I'm guessing that felt like an eternity. It did, and uh, you know, 62 degree water. As I as I mentioned, uh, there's we do wear dry suits, uh, but uh, we typically don't wear dry suits unless the water's below 60 or 55 degrees. So 62 degrees, we don't typically train to wear in dry suits. Well, my core body temperature when I finally got pulled out of the water 25 minutes later was about 94 degrees. So I had. Wow. Uh, 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 some hypothermia going on as I got pulled out of the water. And then there was never any question on where you were. It just took that long to pick you never up. Never a question on where Whoa. I was. An interesting okay. story. I was in the shock. Uh, I had uh, a couple of my manuals that were in my helmet bag float by me, and I was thought, well, I better grab these because the NATOPS <laughs> officer, who is the guy who controls those manuals, was going to be very upset if I lost those. Uh, and then the uh, nose gear door floated by me, and I had it had the name of my command master chief on it. And I thought he'd think that was a nice souvenir. So I took those things in and about 15 minutes later, when the shock wore off, I wondered what the heck am I doing? And I got rid of those. So. <laughs> well, it's too bad. Those might've been good mementos. So, all right. So they pick you up, they take you back to the ship. They probably look you over. You, you obviously were okay. Cause you got to fly again, which is. Yeah, I actually flew eight days later. I needed to fly again. Uh, I, the longer I waited to fly the, it was going to be harder to, to actually get back in the aircraft and strap that, uh, ejection seat to my body. Uh, so we didn't fly for about eight days because we were transiting over to Afghanistan. So it was designed uh, uh, not to not to fly until May ni- or March 9th. And I told you I ejected on March 2nd. I flew again on March 10th. So uh, it was good for me. Uh, I needed that. As, talking about the injuries, uh, when I ejected, really only two injuries I had. So the first thing, I didn't feel anything when I was down in medical getting evaluated uh, for in, until the next day. Uh, which was my back. So what happens with that force of the ejection, I actually shrunk two inches. You shrunk two inches? Yeah. So a week later, I'm getting checked out by the corpsman to get uh, medically cleared to go fly. And he checks my weight and height. And he says, you're five foot 10. I said, no, I'm six foot. He's like, well, you're five foot 10. So we get another scale and he measures me again. He says, no, you're five ten. He didn't believe that I was six foot. He had to look in my record to see from previous physicals that I was six foot. What happens is the your spine compresses your discs grab and it holds that spine in place. So I was, I went from six foot to five foot 10. I've, 
I've slowly gained that back. It so the soft couple- tissue in between your bones and your spine basically gave way and all that free space was collapsed. Correct. And you shrunk two inches. That is Correct. crazy. Wow. Uh, the only other injuries I had uh, was I, I talked about the leg restraints, which pull your legs underneath the ejection seat. Well, it pulls them uh, so violently that I had really deep calf bruises. So the first time I got out of uh, the bed in medical, uh, I almost fell over because my, my calves were so deeply bruised that uh, I, couldn't, I really couldn't put much weight on them. Well, I guess by comparison, though, you ended up lucky, wouldn't you say? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the sad part of the story is uh, the pilot did not survive the ejection. So uh, his ejection, and we talked about the timing sequence. So the canopy goes four-tenths of a second later, then I go four-tenths of a second later as a, as a backseater, and then the pilot goes four-tenths of a second after me. Well, the reason I'm here doing this podcast and talking to you, Jello, is because I went four tenths of a second later before my pilot. His ejection was coincident with the plane hitting the water. Just really couldn't. Uh, his body, with that force of the impact, with the force of the ejection, was just too much. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, he did not survive. Well, that's unfortunate. Uh, obviously, you knew him, uh, being crewed with him and the squadron and whatnot. I actually knew Basher as well. Um, he was our air wing LSO on a previous cruise, and I've got a picture of him hanging out in our ready room and. Uh, you know, that's unfortunately part of the fighter pilot business is not everybody makes it. And I don't mean to be trite about it in this example, but it is a dangerous business. And in this case, the the difference between, like you said, you surviving and bash or not is less than a half a second. Yeah, less than a half a second. It's pretty sobering when I think about it. For sure. And um, um, I mean, you're able to be blessed with your family and whatnot. And Basher had a family, is that correct? Yeah, he did. So he was married, had two kids, uh, four and seven. I have kids about that age, so I think about it often. Uh, his kids, uh, obviously, 15 years later, have grown up, and sort of the good news story, or uh, what what I consider good news, and I'm excited to follow his career path, is his oldest son uh, just finished and got his wings as a, and is a naval flight officer and is currently training in Virginia Beach uh, to fly the F-18. Outstanding. So he's following his father's footsteps, even though he lost him at a young age and uh, was still attracted to the business despite its obvious dangers. Sure is, yeah. That's cool. All right, Bloach. Well, uh, unless you've got anything else to talk about, I think that's going to wrap up our discussion on ejection seats. I do appreciate you coming on the show today. You know, we've got a little tradition I've created here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, and that is we ask everyone to explain their call sign. So uh, I said at the beginning that you're Bloach. Uh, which I don't know if that's an acronym or what that means. Can you tell us when you got your call sign and what it means? Yeah, I got my call sign when I was training to fly the F-14. So I was in Oceana and uh, I, bloach stands for blow chunks. So blow Blow chunks, chunks, uh, throwing up. Ah, okay. Losing your lunch. From Um, partying too hard or? uh, Maybe some of that, but no, mostly from uh, the, just flying the aircraft, the G's. Ah, air sickness. Air sickness, you got it. So, uh, when I was in, in flight school, I, I, I bloached just about every flight, and I kind of hit it. I, I, I'd puke and rally, if you will, because I didn't want to, uh, have to have to go through the spin and puke. And I got the F-14, and I maybe didn't hide it so well, so some guys thought it would be funny to call me bloach. Luckily, once I started flying consistently, uh, I got used to the, the air sickness. I kind of got over the air sickness, so I don't do it anymore, but uh, bloach has stood throughout the years. I would say... It sounds like, for your story, you lasted longer than most, but I know I had battles of air sickness uh, when I first started, and I would say probably more people did than didn't, just because it's not a normal thing for your body to suddenly go up in the air and do that, unless you've got some previous experience. But All right, well, that's a good one. Appreciate you sharing that with us. Well, thanks again for coming on the show, and uh, we really do appreciate it. Best of luck to you in the uh, rest of your career. Thanks, Jello. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. All right, well, let's get out of here. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed that discussion on ejection seats with U.S. Navy Commander Rafe Weisham. Obviously, a tragic story he tells there, and our hearts go out to Basher's family, but pretty cool to see that his son uh, was not deterred and is following his father's footsteps. Just one term in listening to that again that I want to mention, and that is spin and puke. (laughs) Uh, Essentially, what that is is slang for a centrifuge. And if you've ever seen the old movie Spies Like Us, I believe uh, Dan Aykroyd and Chevy Chase get put through the centrifuge, and of course they kind of overdo it a little bit. But um, it really is just a device where they spin you around and they can simulate G-forces without actually going out and flying. And 
they make all fighter pilots and crew go through it. Uh, the one I went through towards the end of my career was down in San Antonio, Texas. And I did that in preparation for flying the F-16. In fact, on an upcoming episode about pulling G's, I've got a still taken from the video of that that I might use as the cover art on my website for that photograph because it shows me uh, pulling nine point, almost 9.1 G's. And my wife hates the picture because I think one eye's looking one way and the one's looking the other. And I'm bearing down trying to stay awake. So, uh, But the centrifuge, they, they teach you what to do. They check your G suit, make sure it fits real snug, and they'll put you through that. Uh, everyone has to go through it before they can fly now. Uh, I, that came later for me, but, uh, now it's a prerequisite. And then if you're having trouble pulling G's or anything else, then they'll, they'll put you in there as well. And they can critique you real time as you're actually spinning around. They can give you feedback on your anti-G straining maneuver. And they call it the spin and puke because, you know, air sickness is a reality anyway. But when you are, when you are simulating G forces by spinning around in a circle, even though they tell you how to try to avoid it, your inner ear can still get messed up. So a lot of times people get sick from that. And uh, th that's obviously no fun, especially when you're spinning around at nine G's. All right. I think that will do it for this episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I want to thank you for listening. If you have a question for the show, send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MOCK-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. And you can also find us on all the usual social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Please like, follow, and share us with your network. And if you have a moment to leave us a rating and review on iTunes, we would greatly appreciate it. We're trying to bust into that new and interesting, or whatever they call it, uh, front level on iTunes. So we're hoping to jump in there and... Uh, get discovered by a lot more listeners. Well, this is as good a time as any to remind you that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of myself and my guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. So with that, look for us in about another 11 days or so. In the meantime, you take it easy and we'll see you.